And hello everyone, my name is Asmo, like Marita just repeated. Uh, just briefly about myself before we get started. Uh, I'm the CTO of a company called HiQ Finland, operating here in Finland, but based off, off of Sweden. And also, besides being the CTO, I'm the director of product development for our very own integration platform slash API platform called Friends. Some of you who may know it, some of you who may not. And like Marjotta kind of talked me into this, uh, I was thinking about what should I be talking about today, and rather than go kind of super technical and into the nits and bits and details of uh, how we would do certain types of APIs or how we would manage certain types of APIs, I thought it would be refreshing to actually go through a practical case where we basically helped a customer achieve that digital transformation, achieve that leap from kind of the traditional business world into the API economy or platform economy. And this links really nicely, and I, this actually wasn't planned, but this links really nicely to yesterday's talk, talk about mobility as a service, since it's actually, this is one of the customers there who is hooked into that mobility as a service, service backend, and one of the kind of companies providing that actual mobility in the, in the backend there. And the company, of course, is, is the largest taxi provider in Finland called Lähi Taxi. So pretty much kind of from my perspective, the, the kind of starting point for this customer uh, was that they basically had existing kind of order channels where you could use a mobile app to get a taxi. You could use third party services to order order a taxi through through a kind of peer to peer or B2B services. And they had all of these kind of bits and pieces pieces in place. But they had some really big challenges in, for example, not being able to compete with the customer experience with things like Uber, for example. So they were clearly kind of losing a little bit of <laughs> traction on the market, and they decided that something needed to be done. And the kind of whole big problem boiled down to basically this architecture picture here, where in the middle you see this <laughs> kind of monstrous spaghetti monster which is kind of the root of many, many different problems when you're talking about APIs and kind of modernizing, modernizing businesses and, and the kind of digital transformation leap in, in many, many cases. And the problem basically arose because even though there were APIs, and, and of course there was an existing mobile backend that did have APIs towards which, for example, the mobile, mobile device is connected towards, and they did have some APIs that, for example, then the driver's PDA or the taxi meter communicated with, uh, all of those were connected independently to their backend systems, and they didn't have a clear kind of a managed API uh, center. And there's been a lot of great talks about today about API management and centralized API management, distributed API management, but they didn't have anything of that sort. So anything new that they were trying to build was hugely expensive and took forever, and they didn't really have any sort of an ecosystem strategy in place. So when we're talking about kind of these ecosystems or the API economy, uh, even though it might have been technically possible for them to do that, they didn't have that sort of a strategy in place, which resulted in kind of this half measures along all the way. So basically, we came in, and what we did, we did APIs, APIs, and more APIs. So the whole point of this is that this is actually uh, a kind of a real life picture from the, some of the APIs, all of them couldn't fit on the screen without making them, making them super, super small. But basically what they did there is kind of expose all of their business functionality in the form of open APIs. And when I say open APIs, I mean that they're, uh, if you know where to go, <laughs> they're available to all the public kind of to be able to view what sort of APIs there are. And, and some of you might be familiar with the kind of technology used here. So it's open API specification slash, slash swagger. But the whole point is that all of the functions that the company has should be available as public APIs. And this was the starting point from which, where we kind of took off. And of course, you can see the end result here in, in, in some, some expanse. But pretty much the kind of approach that we take is, of course, we are talking about, I'm, I'm representing a company called HiQ, and we have our own integration platform called Friends. And what we basically did for the customer 
uh, is to simplify that whole picture on the first screen. So if you remember that humongous packaging monster with tens and tens and tens and tens of different connections toward different backend systems and tens and tens of different APIs kind of all working towards the same goal, but still separate from one another. So what we wanted to do there is harmonize the whole thing. So have a single simple API portal where all of the APIs would be exposed in the cloud. So this was a big change for the customer as well, since they used to be exposing and kind of connecting all of their different devices and mobile services directly towards the on-premise systems and had this sort of a traditional demilitarized zone set up there. So one of the biggest, biggest points was there that we wanted, to, if we wanted to go towards the kind of public open API architecture and ideology, we needed to expose the APIs in a public cloud to have that scalability and have the benefits of the cloud available for us there. But the biggest problem here, of, of course, was that in order for our APIs to actually do something, they need to be connected with the customer's business systems and business processes. So what this actually means is that if you can imagine being a taxi company and you've been formed 30 or 40 years ago, your basically ERP or customer uh, CRM systems or anything relating to how your business runs is used in really old legacy systems and systems that in this case, for example, were designed but to serve a customer service representative who basically s s sat there all day just waiting for a phone call that I want to order a taxi to this and this location and then type that in to the system and that would actually then uh, bring the taxi to that location. So what we wanted to also do in, ad in addition to the kind of cloud portion there and have that single unified API, uh, API portal is actually automate the business processes that are related in, for example, ordering a taxi. So uh, you wouldn't believe how complicated it is to work with a system that's designed to be used manually by an, a taxi operator to try and automate that into the form of an API, since replacing all of these systems here in the backend would have been impossible in the time frame that the customer wanted to, wanted to kind of run in. And also trying to build a, build a sort of a microservice architecture was out of the time frame, so that would have taken too long. So they needed to reuse the functionality that they had in the first phase here at least, and have that still appear as a nice modern uh, API, have embraced that API economy, embraced that uh, API portal thinking and that platform eco economy ideology. So we use friends there in this particular case. So how does that actually work? Uh, pretty simple. Uh, we utilize a technique called low-code mini-services. We've, we've heard a lot of talk about microservices today. I'm going to mention something about mini-services, which is a term coined by Gartner to act as kind of mediator between these macro services, which are the kind of traditional services that everyone remembers, like SOAP back in the olden days, and well, of course, then the more modern micro services. So mini services are kind of in the between, between world or in the, in the halfway there, because what they do is that they're not infinitely scalable because they are always connected to some other system data uh, they have dependencies, is what I'm trying to say. So what we wanted to do there is package the connectivity towards the old legacy systems in what we are calling mini-services, and then build up that order a taxi API by consuming a whole bunch of different mini-service or microservice calls in the kind of bottommost layer, and then create also the business logic that used to be partly in the head of the customer service representative doing the taxi ordering, but also embedded in the legacy application. So move that logic away from those difficult legacy, le legacy applications and also move it, make it not, a per, not person dependent or, or employee dependent in that case and have the kind of API engine, as we like to call it, create that logic, uphold that logic, and, and, and expose the API itself. And then, of course, well, I'm not going to spend any time talking about API gateways and security, since there, there's been a lot of good talks today governing that area, and, and I believe everyone's heard quite a bit about that. So if we move 
one step further here, how does this all kind of come together uh, is, well, basically, we have the API that we are exposing in the cloud, utilizing, of course, our friends. We're hooking it to a third-party identity provider. There's been a, it, it might or might not have been a, a provider that's present here today as a sponsor. Who, who knows? And uh, in the bottom there, we then do what we are calling kind of hybrid calls. So we are passing the kind of API orchestration calls to the kind of system level mini services that then wrap the functionality of the legacy or backend system together to then create the actual API that then, for example, the new Lahitaxi mobile app is using. But also, so now here's the link to yesterday's mobility as a service talk. It's exactly the same API used by their mobile app as it's being used by all the other apps or services in that kind of a mobility ecosystem. And now they don't have to worry about uh, how to manage that big picture and how to keep everything coherent since they only expose a single API portal, a single API catalog, and all of their kind of partners, own mobile apps, future partnerships, everything like that will go through that same API exposure there. And to kind of maybe further illustrate the point here a little bit of what I'm trying to make uh, or when I talk about uh, how we automized some of the business processes and logic, and this is actually how we build things in, in Friends, is that we manage or we kind of model the uh, required steps for the API, or in this case, we're also talking about the business process when we're ordering an API. And th this is not a real picture, since the real picture would have been at least 10 times as large with at least 20 times as much logic in it. So I've kind of simplified a little bit for you guys to kind of get the ideology here. But the basic point here is that now when there's, a, let's say, a user clicks the order taxi button, in an application. The API call, of course, comes in authenticated using OpenID Connect and, and OAuth2 with JWT uh, tokens. Uh, we, of course, do the authorization and authentication in the cloud there. The, we do some pre-processing for that API call in the cloud. So even though the actual taxi order is input to a system here in the kind of on-premise or ground network, we do some sort of pre little pre-processing here and there to kind of make sure that is everything all right. So in case if we're just validating the order, but an important bit here also is that, that a thing that's usually or sometimes overlooked at when thinking about APIs is that uh, using the identity of the API consumer as part of the business logic of the API that we're building. So for example, in this case, uh, if you've ever tried, you can't have two active orders on the taxi app at the same time, because then, well, which is the taxi or which is the car that would come and pick you up? So this is a perfect example of we're actually using the identity from the JWT token and from the authentication inside the API, not just for authorization, but to implement business logic based on that as well. So for example, just checking, does that user which has pressed my order taxi button have active orders going on uh, at this time? If so, then we basically just say that, oh, hey, hey, hold on. You can't have two, more than two orders active at the same time. And we've moved that logic now also away from the mobile app. Yeah, <laughs> also away from the mobile app, but also away from the legacy server or legacy system there in the back end to this sort of a middle layer or the API layer, as we like to call it, because this logic should apply to everyone who is using this service. So if I want to order a taxi using the API, it shouldn't matter if I'm the owner of my kind of own application or I'm using some sort of an ecosystem application to consume that same API. The same business ruling should apply in all cases and we should standardize and harmonize that access there. And then finally, what we do is when all is said and done is like I said, pass that information to another API or a mini service in our case, which is then actually implementing the kind of order input 
into the legacy system. And there's actually even some robotics involved there and, and, and cool stuff, but which I, think, I don't think I have time to, to go into at, at this, this time. But this is pretty much all I wanted to show, show to you guys today. And some numbers, because numbers are fun and interesting. Don't try to argue with me. Uh, but basically, to kind of give you an idea of the scope that, would, that were kind of was required in order for this to, this to actually happen, is that we have 45 unique APIs, and there are over 600 steps or kind of business logic positions there hidden inside the APIs. So when I'm talking about API steps, I'm talking about things like this where we're actually performing some sort of functionality or performing some sort of business logic validation in that case. And currently, it's doing really well. It uh, has a hun over 100,000 uh, downloads on the new application and over 300,000 API calls coming in every day. And I even put that there since, obviously, not all of the calls are going to end up perfectly because if you remember, we talked about the mini-service architecture which has dependencies to legacy systems, and that's the reason why this isn't 100, because there are old systems that have unpredictable conditions that are actually then finally dealing with the, with the taxi order and, and making sure that the car is actually there for you when you need it. Perfect. But that's basically all I had to say. Thank you. Hopefully this has been interesting and yes. Thank you, Aswa.